Okay, so um, these these next three panelists um, have a special relationship uh, uh, with the Empirical Educator Project in the sense that I don't know if any of this would not have happened if I had not interviewed the three of you uh, about two years ago, Marsha Lovett, Ken Kadener, and Lauren Herkes. Um, I was here on a, uh, a press fellowship. Um, I think people sometimes don't know what uh, have category to put me in. That week I was press. Um, so, um, and Ken, I'd heard you interviewed I had heard you give a talk once before, Marsha and, and Lauren. I had not met you before. I brought a camera and shoved it in your faces and just started asking questions. And I hit the jackpot. Um, so the th three of you together um, and the complementary perspectives that you gave me really influenced my thinking. Um, and I knew that. But I didn't realize the totality of how it all fit together until I was putting together this program. Um, and I was thinking about putting you all on a panel. And the jigsaw puzzles all fit together, um, uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces. Um, and so I thought, OK, let's just lay them out for everybody. So this, this is, I think, is um, where you, Marsha, convinced me that maybe this is uh, 1.0 beta. Uh, at least inside my brain now. Um, so um, let's start. Um, by the way, these interviews are all, uh, the ones I'm talking about are all on the Illiterate TV YouTube channel if you want to go and watch them. Um, Ken, um, in your interview, um, you were talking about um, being wrong about what students find hard. And that happens to be one of your areas of uh, um, expertise in research. Um, but you were also talking about it from a very personal perspective as, as an educator. You were talking about how you will um, create test questions with two different versions, where you have one version that has the hard part, the hypothesized hard part, as you put it, and another version that has that doesn't have it. And you said it was really striking how often you're wrong about what students find hard. You said could be almost half the time. And you're very matter of fact about it, right? And um, I think there are a lot of faculty members who would find it scandalous to admit that their uh, colleague it says they're wrong almost half the time about what students find hard. Um, and I think they would find it very difficult to admit that. So I want to I get to the science behind that. But first, I was wondering if you could talk about your personal journey as an educator, learning the scholarship of that, and what it was like to come to that realization. Uh, well. Stop me if this story gets too long. I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> I started in computer science, and I was very much interested in AI. But I, I got frustrated at some point because I thought people who were trying to build artificial intelligence were just sitting in their armchairs thinking about how think people think, not studying how people think. And I ended up coming here to CMU, switching PhD programs to a psychology PhD program. And I started to learn a lot about data. And the more I collected data, the more I realized that a lot of my intuitions, for example, about like I read Polya, if you, if you guys know this mathematical problem solving, great stuff about general problem solving. Tried to teach it to geometry students. Kept bumping my head against how uh, often the trouble for students isn't their general problem solving skills, but they're acquiring the content knowledge. Uh, but perhaps the most striking example of this kind of comparison came when I was working on an algebra, high school algebra project, and I wanted to understand why story problems, algebra story problems, are so hard for students. And I made a set of quizzes with matched story problems and equations. So the same math involved. Gave them out uh, on multiple forms and then looked at the data. 
uh, to try to understand why the story problems are harder. And uh, <laughs> I was stuck because they weren't. The equations turned out to be harder. Uh, and a whole long story about that. But I think part of my personal journey, it helped to be externalizing it at first, right? I was showing other instructors how their intuitions were wrong. Uh, but it can't, can't come to believe that a lot of our expertise is tacit, is implicit. We are, we're not aware of our own expertise. We don't know what we know. And therein is the opening for, for uh, making these kinds of mistakes. And I certainly can, can say more about how this has uh, affected my own teaching. But I, I thought setting it up that, with the background would help. Yeah, so um, I, I'm, I would love for you to say more about that, how it's affected your own teaching. That's a good prompt for you to find Ken later. Um, uh, so I'm mindful of the time. Could you just say a little bit about uh, expert blindness? Uh, expert uh, uh, blind uh, spot, I guess, was the phrase we uh, used years ago. I now think it's much bigger than a spot, like maybe 70% of what you know, you don't know you know. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think I, I was teaching research methods uh, to, to PhD and master's students this semester. And you know, I, I, I asked them at the end of the course, what, what are some examples of great education researchers that you respect? And what do they do? What makes their education research special that makes them stand out? And we've got a long list of things. And some of those things overlapped with what we taught in the course, but a lot of them didn't. And there, there and again is that message, like we're not always teaching what students need to know because we don't realize that we do it because it's part of our tacit knowledge. And, and it's striking. When we collect that data and l listen closely, we can really improve our courses. Right. Now, Marsha, when, when you and I talked, um, there was we also talked about tacit knowledge, but it was almost a mirror image of our, on my conversation with Ken. You were talking about um, uh, things that educators know that they don't know in terms of helping students, right? That they have certain moves that are intuitive um, that th either they're not aware that they're doing or they're aware that they're doing, but they don't know how to articulate to people in ways that, that allow, would enable them to transfer that, right? So could, um, same question to you. When you, when you were... Um, uh, uh, as, a, as a faculty member on your journey um, to becoming this, the scholar that you are now, um, what, what was it like to learn that about yourself? So you're asking me to think back just a few years when I was a newly minted assistant professor. Um, and like many faculty members, I wasn't taught how to teach. I was thrown in to teach the Introduction to Cognitive Psychology, which is a lecture course. And I had close to 100 students. And the preparation that I had was um, borrowing uh, the previous instructor's notes, lecture notes. So there I was teaching these students. And um, I found myself doing two things, I think, that speak to this. that I kind of noticed that I was doing them in a recurring fashion. One was I was trying to link the material to students' lives as often as I could. And the second is instead of just lecturing at them, I was asking students to solve little problems or work on small tasks throughout class. You would call this active learning today. Um, it's before that was <laughs> commonly. Um, mentioned term. And so that second thing, the active learning thing, is consistent with my training as a learning scientist, but I wasn't just doing it for the students. I was doing it for myself because I needed the data on were they getting it above and beyond the, the two people in the front row who would always raise their hand and respond. I needed to know of the whole 80, 90, 100 students who was 
able to solve a problem after we had just talked about a certain topic. So I think that, I would say, um, was the pair of things I did the most. Now, the first one about relating it to their lives, that wasn't my area of expertise. I was trained in cognitive experimental psychology and learning science. So I started reading more of the research on motivation and metacognition. Kind of went the opposite way in that topic. Mm. And um, so now that you're there, um, how do you how do you go about researching um, uh, something that uh, educators are unconscious that they're doing, and then how do you talk about it with them? So this reminds me of a story. <laughs> um, and I think it's a legend. I don't think it's actually a true story. But maybe folks in the room have heard of it and afterwards can tell me that's actually true. So um, I'll get up to, to demonstrate the story. So you, there was a, a teacher whose teaching strategy involved lecturing and pacing. And this teacher's pacing was driving the students nutty. So they got together and colluded. And whenever the instructor was pacing this way, they'd be very attentive and engaged. But when the teacher was going this way, they'd be bored and disengaged. And they entrained this person to basically be lecturing from the one side of the room. <laughs> now, granted, that's not a great model for a good pedagogy. But what it shows is that by experimenting with different strategies, and hopefully we have more strategies than which direction to pace while you lecture, but by experimenting with those different strategies and paying attention to the data that students, uh, the signals that they're sending, either their engagement, their learning, et cetera, we can tweak and adjust in that way to get better um, teaching strategies. Um, how, do we, how do we study that? How do we support that? Well, here at Carnegie Mellon, and I'm guessing at, at the universities and colleges of the folks in the room, we have a teaching center. Ours is called the Eberly Center, and it's a teaching and ed tech center. A common thing we do is um, if a faculty member wants some help to um, adjust their teaching strategies to improve student learning, we might conduct a classroom visit, classroom observation. Um, because it's really hard to be teaching. I call it teaching one of the most challenging multitasks. You're, you're managing the time, you're following your notes, you're managing technology, you're trying to figure out if the students are understanding or not and how to adjust. So it's helpful to have another set of eyes in the room. And by doing that, the classroom ob observation consultant can actually be tracking things, like when you asked a question, how long did you pause? Or did you just answer your own question? Um, how many students in the room were engaged and participating? Was there a sign of selectivity to the um, engagement of students? So that's a typical thing. What we are able to do now with this lovely new building is in our center, which is down the hall, we designed two classrooms that are instrumented. So that if faculty members are willing to come and teach in our classroom, we can observe them with a person taking notes and whatnot. But we can also collect data in the room as they're teaching live, maybe even every time they're teaching, if they want to teach the whole semester in there. And then we're working to get more and more automated ways to take those data and feed them back to the faculty member so that they can reflect on their teaching through these classroom observation data sets. Again, I'm, I'm going to resist going down the path here, but um, to put in a plug that there will be um, tours of that instrumented class, those instrumented classrooms later in the day. Um, now, Lauren, you're an anthropologist. I saw those heads perk up. Uh, I was waiting for that. Um, and um, you did a study of Carnegie Mellon professors. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so first, uh, um, just want to make sure I'm making. Yes, I I don't want to jump the gun here. Can you just just Give us a description of the study. Sure. Um, well, we started by thinking about the fact that Carnegie Mellon has a, a long and storied history of uh, learning science research and innovation. You know that we know so much more now than we did even five years ago, but certainly ten years ago, twenty years ago, about um, about how learning works, about how to teach well, 
and how to develop practices and technologies that we can measure improved learning outcomes for students. We know that they work. And so this question of uh, what next, you know, why aren't we seeing these broadly adopted, you know, even at Carnegie Mellon, was raised. You know, when, when folks think about um, barriers to the adoption of evidence-based teaching tools or practices, the most common reason that people cite uh, for, um, for the, the lack of widespread sustained adoption that they, they hope to see are institutional culture and structures. So you call an anthropologist <laughs> to think about culture. So we spent uh, um, almost two years looking at the question of institutional culture and structures. How can we better understand the, the way that teaching and learning happens, the way the, that instructional innovation takes place at Carnegie Mellon? And uh, so we started by, um, by choosing four projects, um, innovative teaching projects, to follow for almost a year. We, uh, we distributed a, a hypothesis generating survey and followed these four projects through development and improvement as people tried them out in classrooms or online with real students, uh, decided what worked and what didn't, worked to improve them and to try again. And, uh, and so during this time, I had the privilege of sitting in on a lot of meetings, <laughs> being copied on a lot of email chains, um, thinking through the process with a lot of folks, uh, you know, throughout the, the process of following four projects, I regularly interviewed people involved, I sit, sat in on classrooms and was able to take kind of a bird's eye view. You know, anyone who's involved in a collaborative project to do something has a role and has to work with other people and has goals and has concerns. And so the luxury of being in the room without having to uh, achieve very specific collaborative goals allows someone who's in that privileged position to take a different perspective, to, to generate a different set of understandings. So over the course of a couple of years of following four projects and, and getting some ideas about what might be working and what might be challenging and um, interviewing a lot of people for a lot of hours, we came up with a, a broad set of barriers and facilitators to the adoption of evidence-based teaching tools and practices. And it's been a, a really interesting process. Now, I know you're going to talk about some of this tomorrow, so we don't, no spoilers on that. But um, uh, I wonder if you could, um, get, given what we've just heard about what faculty don't know that they know and what they don't know that they don't know, right, give, give us a, a, a story or two about how faculty do think about their teaching. How do they conceptualize it? Where, does, where do their ideas about um, good teaching come from? Well, that's, that's a great question. And I love that we've been talking about personal journeys so far. Because one thing that, um, that came through loud and clear, every single educator who I spoke to in the course of the project that I was just talking about, and um, virtually everyone I've spoken to since, cares deeply about teaching and teaching well. Teaching and their students are among the most important things in, in virtually every one of these educators' lives. So teaching well, being a, a good professor, being a, an excellent educator is a shared value. But what that means to different people is different. And so I've been thinking a lot over the last year or so about uh, origin stories, like superhero origin stories. But these are educator origin stories. And there are a lot. You know, the, these educators who care deeply about teaching have different ways of thinking about what it means to teach well. And that shapes the way they engage with students, the way they think about adopting new methods in the classroom, whether or not they use someone's notes or iteratively improve test questions. You know, what seems important? So there are some faculty for whom building relationships, connecting with students is the most important thing. If they can just connect and build that relationship, then the rest will follow. Doesn't mean that other things aren't important, but that's paramount. And that really shapes the way that folks think about what's important in teaching. There are, there are people for whom um, finding the right challenge, like knowing students may not like it, they may not like me, but when they grapple with this problem, I mean, they just need to be thrown into the deep end. 
they'll learn to swim and they'll thank me for it later or they won't, but they'll learn to swim. So there are these different ideas about teaching effectiveness and I think that um, personal journeys are important and as we just heard, a lot of educators don't have explicit instruction on how to teach well. So anyone who has ever taught and almost anybody who's ever been a student, if you ask, well, what makes someone a good teacher? They have ideas. And you can take a minute and think about where those ideas come from. And you get these incredible stories. I get these incredible stories. I hear, uh, when I was in high school, I had a swim coach who told me that, you know, it may not be comfortable, but you just practice and it'll become second nature. And that really drives the way I think about what my students should be doing. Um, I, uh, my, favorite, my favorite story, because it um, kind of encapsulates the whole idea about this, is uh, a, a woman who is a junior faculty member. Um, I asked her how she came to teach the way that she teaches. And she described a moment when she was a first year student as an undergraduate. So this was some years ago. Uh, she said that she was taking a class that was just fantastic. This is the class that convinced her to declare a major. It was so engaging. Every time she went to class, she learned new things. She thought it, it was exciting and interesting and engaging and revelatory. And one day after class, about halfway through this semester, she pulled the teacher aside and said, I just want to thank you. This class is so cool. I'm really loving it. I think I'm going to declare this, this as my major. And the professor said, oh, thank you so much. You know, I work really hard on my classes. I try and break it down into small chunks and make it relevant to, to your lives. And you guys have really different references than I do. So that's hard for me. And I keep trying to work in these opportunities for you guys to talk to each other. And, and as they're walking through the hallway having this conversation, the colleague who I was asking to describe this experience said, I was stunned. I didn't know that she thought, I just thought that she really knew her stuff and was really charismatic. I just, I didn't realize she had thought about it that way. And a decade or more later, this person is now a professor and thinking intentionally about how students engage with content and active learning and relevant examples to their lives are core principles that shape the way she teaches. And she set out to learn more about how to teach effectively because she understood from an early moment that when she was a student in the classroom, she saw the tip of the iceberg that there was a lot of planning and thinking and process that went on under the service. So this informs her practice. Alternatively, I interviewed someone who, uh, who I said, well, you know, how, how do you think someone can teach well? What makes someone a good professor? And he said, you know, I think that you just, you need to, to find your style and really try and connect with the students and, and just, just find your own way to do it. And, you know, a lot of people try and model themselves off of someone else. Like, they think that someone's a good professor, and they try and be like that, and it just doesn't work for them. And then, you know, it's awkward, and it's ineffective, and so people just shouldn't do that. But, you know, actually, my father's a professor, and that's what he says. <laughs> I just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> so there's, there's some really interesting ideas about models and, and behavior that don't necessarily go examined. And for the vast majority of faculty at most post-secondary institutions, origin and ideas and personal experiences really shape values and practice. So um, we had far too little time to uh, dig into this. And that we knew that was going to be the case up front. I've just now painted giant targets on the back of, of uh, Marsha, Ken, and, and Lauren. Um, so go find them. Um, the scholarship is, uh, is really interesting in all three cases, but also their experience as socially empirical educators. That's one of the many values of being here at Carnegie Mellon. They actually practice this um, as an institution. So um, what we have here, I think, is the beginnings of a picture of what we're up against and what the Empirical Educator Project is designed to help us grapple with um, uh, as, a, as a sector. So thank you all, and to be continued.